Good evening. I'm glad you're all here tonight and welcome also to all of those out in the internet streaming and those on TV. And uh, before we get started tonight, let's just have a word of prayer that God will bless us with clarity. Dear God, be with us tonight as we discuss this very important topic that it may be life-saving to many of those listening here tonight. Pray for your spirit to be especially with us, that there can be clarity and understanding that we may move ahead and choose what is the highest and best, that we may have the good health that you meant us to have. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in all of our talks, we're talking about the cause of disease and then the effects of it. And tonight, we're going to go back and look at one of the most serious and pervasive causes of disease in our world today, particularly here in this country, but in most of the countries around the world, it is becoming more and more of a serious problem. And we're going to start by looking back at the cause of obesity and showing the, looking at the relationship between sugar consumption and obesity and then how that relates to most of the other disease processes that are affecting us right here. In 1890, the average sugar consumption in this country was about five pounds per person per year. By 1975, we were up to 15 pounds per person per year. And today, um, it's, excuse me, it wasn't 15. Five pounds per person back in the 1980s. Today, it is 150 to 180 pounds of sugar per person today. Well, we can't take that much of this chemical into the body without having some profound effects on the physiology. And what we're going to find tonight is that this sugar consumption and these large excess amounts is really related to much of the disease process. We mentioned obesity. Back in 1890, 3 to 4% of the U.S. population was considered obese. By 75, it was 15%. Today, it's up to 32%. And what's causing that? Well, let's just take a look at that. I'm going to draw just a little graph here. To... Let's make that. We'll just start here with 1975 to current. And in the last few years, what we find is that obesity has significantly increased. The last 30 years, the obesity rate in this country has tripled. The average person today is, and the entire population is 25 pounds heavier than the average person uh, back 30 years ago. Uh, children, our, the obesity rate there is climbing greatly. And in certain populations, black and Hispanic, it's up to 40% that are now meet the criteria for obesity. Obesity is not the only thing that's changing. Type 2 diabetes, another one of these lifestyle diseases. Back in the 1800s, if you took 100,000 people out of the population, three of them would have type 2 diabetes. You know what it is today? Out of 100,000, it's 8,000 have type 2 diabetes. Why this huge increase in disease? And if you start looking at this increase right here, one of the things some people say, well, it's all the fat in the diet. And we look at uh, the fast food industry and McDonald's and the fries and all the greasy stuff and oil and say, surely that's the cause. But if we actually go back and look at it, what we find is that the amount of fat consumed in the diet has actually stayed about the same during the same time period. They actually were frying food and eating greasy food way back then and putting oil and butter and grease on things. And so we can't really connect it with that. But what is it that does correlate with it? 
If we look at the sugar consumption, what we find is that it goes up. The increase in obesity parallels this increase in sugar consumption in the country. And, uh, you know, a good example to understand this increased uh, sugar consumption is just to look at the sodas. By the way, the sodas and the other sugar drinks are one of the main places where you will find the sugar coming in. If you look at the sugar in the American diet, that's where the bulk of it's coming from. Although we put it in all kinds of candies and cooks and cakes and pies and all kinds of other things, this sodas and the sugar drinks is really the big place when it comes from. Remember when Coca-Cola first came out, that really cute, sexy shaped bottle that it was in? You know how big it was? Six and a half ounces. That was the serving size back then. But if you took that serving size and you went down and bought a Coke every day for a year, you would actually have consumed enough extra calories from sugar to gain eight pounds. Now, if we just follow through, in 1955, they came out with the 10 ounce bottles. When I was a kid growing up, that was when what was in the vending machine. Some of you may remember the 10 ounce bottles that was the usual form then. Then, what year did we come up with aluminum cans? 1960. In 1960, we started making aluminum cans and what size are the aluminum cans? We still use those today. 12 ounces. So we've gone to 12 ounces. By the way, if we took that much sugar, uh, that 12 ounces would give you 16 pounds of extra, if you drank a can of soda a day. But today, if you go to a vending machine, you don't find aluminum cans. What do you find in the vending machines now? They're plastic bottles, and what size are they? 20 ounces. Yeah, so now we're at 20 ounces, and that would give you 26 pounds of extra weight if you ate one bottle of soda in one of those 20 ounce bottles a day. But of course, we now have 44 ounce big, you know, the big gulps, the big cups, and then we have a lot of places now you get the 64 ounce cup. I mean, if you drank one of those 64 ounce, that would be 83 pounds per year that we could add on just from the extra calories that is coming in the sugared soda there. A uh, very interesting uh, study that was done, you know, we noticed that obesity is increasing in children. Matter of fact, if you measure the children when they start out in high school and when they end in high school, you notice the change in obesity. And one of the things that they did at this school thing, because they were really realizing that, as I'll put it here. So when the children start out and then over their course in high school, the obesity rate increases, the amount of weight increases. The, those that qualify for obese on the various criteria scales there. So they did an experiment. They took half of the schools in a certain school district and they removed all of the sodas and sugar drinks from all of the vending machines. So they could not get them at school. Now this didn't change what the kids would do at home or with their friends after school or whatever. This just barely changed what was available there. And you know what they found? The fascinating thing was that the obesity rate did not go up in those schools where they took the soda machines out of the school. Fascinating uh, thought there. So what is sugar? We're gonna need to take a look at that, but when you get cancer, it's called sucrose. Sucrose is a double sugar. It's two simple sugars put together. One of them is glucose. We talked a lot about that in one of our first lectures here. Six carbon sugar, our body uses it for energy. But sucrose is a double sugar and it's combined with 
Fructose. Fructose is a five carbon sugar. It's different than glucose. It's handled differently in the body. And it's those two together that make up sucrose. Now, when it hits your digestive tract, almost instantly, those two are separated apart and we have a 50-50 mixture of glucose and fructose, half of each in the system right there. Now, what we're gonna find as we look at our study tonight, fructose is the problem. Large amounts of fructose. Essentially what we're talking about is fructose poisoning. Um, and we'll look at how that happens metabolically and how that causes diseases. But we've gone beyond sucrose today and now we have something we call what? High fructose corn syrup. And it's way cheaper than sucrose. And through various processes, it is up to usually around 55% fructose and 45% glucose. Glucose is, of course, what your body uses for fuel, and the body has many ways to handle and take care of it, and it's no problem. It's the uh, fructose, the 55% this, and the 50% here, because of this excess amount where we're taking in an average of 150 pounds of sugar that we are really poisoning the system. Um, you know, fructose is a poison, and somebody says, well, what about fruit? Doesn't fruit have uh, fructose in it? Yeah, but whenever God packages, puts something poisonous, he packages the antidote with it, and the antidote is fiber. Of course, there's no fiber in a bottle of soda, but uh, when you eat an apple, the fructose in there has the fiber, which counterbalances it, and so that it's not a problem. Um, in just the amount, on the average diet of fruits and vegetables, if the only fructose you got came from eating all the different mangoes and peaches and strawberries and stuff, you would average about 15 grams uh, per day, which was, you know, about what the population was getting in fructose back in the 1800s, anywhere from uh, 15 to 24 grams of fructose a day would be typical in this country. By 1977, it was up to 37 grams. By 1994, 55. And today, we're up to 75 grams of fructose every day. Well, there's a big difference between this 15 and 75. And all of this excess fructose is way more than the body can handle. So let's take a look now at what is actually going on in the body. I think you'll find this very fascinating and lightning. And we're going to take a look at it in a liver cell. Liver cells are chemical processing plants. But beyond just processing all kinds of things, thousands of different things, their job is to take care of toxic things and get rid of bad things, as well as processing many of the useful things that we get here. So we're going to start off our look at here and look at glucose. Remember glucose? We talked about that the first night. Matter of fact, we even talked about how glucose was particularly used in the liver cell, remember? So I'm gonna draw an arrow coming in here. And remember what uh, happened inside of the uh, liver it did with all the extra glucose. Now, suppose we should put a mitochondria here. We use that. Here. Mitochondria is in here. And the liver needs a certain amount of glucose to go into the mitochondria 
to provide the energy needs of the liver cell. But of course, if we're on the typical American load of sugar today, with our sodas and all of our other forms of sugar, there's way more glucose that needs to be processed than what can just be eaten and used by all the cells in the body. Um, by the way, do you know how much extra glucose goes into the liver? About 80% of it ends up going into the liver. And what is the liver going to do with it? Remember we talked about it in the first lecture. It's going to store it. Remember we called it canned glucose or glycogen. So we'll just draw a little can right here, a little jar. Glycogen. This is our canned glucose, the stored form of sugar we put on the shelf. We save this glucose for another day. Someday when it gets a little hypoglycemic in the blood, you skip breakfast, the, we can just open that up and dump the glucose back into the bloodstream. And so we have this in and out. Glucose can come in, and as I said, about This here. So, when you eat food and all of these things has sugar in it, glucose goes to every cell in the body, and about 80% of it is being used up by all the cells in the body, but there's still about 20% of it that's going to go to the liver and be stored in this can form so you've got a reserve. It's sort of like charging up a battery and then it can release it to supply the energy that the body needs later right there. And uh, simple, nice arrangement and keeps us with a good sugar level. Now before we talk about fructose, I want to talk about another thing the liver burns, alcohol. Alcohol is actually a fuel. Alcoholics can live on just their alcohol. They get quite nutrient deficient when they don't eat food and just drink alcohol, but it can provide the fuel. So we're gonna draw down here. There. There, we've got some alcohol. And when you drink alcohol, what happens to it? Well, about 20% of it ends up going to the brain and other tissues and, you know, causing all kinds of problems and, you know, result of a lot of issues there. But about 80% of that alcohol actually ends up going to the liver. The liver's job is to get rid of toxic things. And so it takes the alcohol into the liver cell. And when it gets inside the liver cell, well, that alcohol does all kinds of bad toxic reactions that can damage the liver cell, ending up in cirrhosis of the liver and um, other issues there. But eventually, as it goes through several stages, we'll simplify it here. It sends the alcohol to the mitochondria to be burned. Now, how much alcohol is going into that mitochondria? A whole lot more than glucose. Remember, only 20% of the glucose goes to the liver, and most of that is made into glycogen. But a little bit of it goes down and ends up in the mitochondria. But the alcohol here, by the way, we'll just put out here, 80% of the alcohol has got to go to the liver here to be detoxified. Now, the liver cell cannot use that much fuel to run on. And so what does it do with all of that extra? Well, the mitochondria is going to send it 
to another place here. A long-term storage idea here. It actually sends all the rest of this alcohol down to the fat factory. And here we can take all of that SS alcohol that the body can't actually burn for fuel because there's way too much of it and we can turn it into fat. And where does the fat go? Well, a lot of it just starts building up in little sacks and vacuole little parts here. And the body. Matter of fact, let's get that a color here. here so we know. So now we are developing alcoholic fatty liver disease where we're building up this fat in the liver and of course once you start building up excess fat in the liver it can't work as well. Uh, starts deteriorating, breaking down and actually can help lead to cirrhosis of the liver here. Um, but that's not all. It can also take this extra fat and send it elsewhere in the body. That's right here. And where's a place we could send fat? Well, we can send it to the muscles. Can the muscles burn fat? Yeah, they can. So we'll draw a muscle here. Okay, so we've got a muscle here. But of course, as we learned in our lecture on diabetes, what happens if you put too much fat into the muscle? It can't burn it all at once. And if we start storing fat inside of the muscle, what happens? We start removing the little sugar doors, the insulin receptors on the surface, we get insulin resistance and leads to type two diabetes. So we're going to put up there, you know, we start increasing the insulin levels in here. And why is the insulin levels increased? Because there's too much insulin resistance and we end up with the blood glucose levels getting up. So we increase the blood glucose and the insulin and all of this increase is leading us to what disease process? Diabetes. And of course that's the type 2 diabetes we're talking about here with the excess fat building up in the muscle. So we have the alcohol driving us towards the um, that. And there's one other place it can go and where's that? That is the fat cells. And 
By the way, how does it get from the liver to the fat cells and the muscle cells? Remember? From our second lecture? Remember the little trucks? Yeah. The liver makes the LDL, puts the fat in it, and sends it out to the fat cells and the muscle. And of course, all of this extra fat buildup leads to what we often refer to as the beer belly. Yeah, the alcoholic that's drinking a lot of beer ends up with the beer belly. Okay, now we are gonna go to and look at fructose, where this all was leading right here. So we'll Put our fructose here. How much of the fructose ends up going to the liver? Anybody know? Eight. All of it. There is no cell in the body that can handle fructose. It's a, it's a toxin, a poison, a waste product. The only thing the body can do with is send it all to the liver to be disposed of. So here we've got And it goes through several different steps here, but basically, after all the steps, 100% of that fructose is sent to the mitochondria of the furnace to burn it up. Well, now with this huge amount of fructose that is coming into the body from all the sugar, now the glucose, like we said, it can go to every cell of the body and be burned for fuel, and what does come to the liver can be stored as glycogen and be dumped out later, but 100% of the fructose can be gone here, and you can't store it. The liver has no way of storing it. It's got to get rid of it all by metabolizing it, and of course, the mitochondria can't begin to use that much fructose, and so what does the mitochondria do? Sends it to the fat factory, and we make it into fat, and so we start building up fat in the liver, and end up with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And today, when we start doing ultrasounds and CT scans, which we are doing more and more frequently for diagnosing various things, we're starting to realize so many people have fatty livers. And this fatty liver is not benign. It's actually a very harmful to the individual. And we suspect that over the next decade, the amount of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is actually going to be causing more cirrhosis of the liver than alcoholic disease is causing. So it's going to become the number one uh, cause of liver failure and cirrhosis in the future here because it's increasing so much here. And of course, we find that uh, it's going to the muscle cells there and in the muscle cells, we're doing the same thing, driving us toward diabetes. So again, all this sugar, it's not only the sugar that's in the blood that's pushing us that route, but all of the fructose is coming here, turning into fat, the fat's going to the muscles and driving us into diabetes. And of course, the fructose is also going to the fat cells and causing the fructose belly. Sort of like the beer belly, we also can get a fructose belly. It's the same process, the same thing. We're going through the same stage. And this central obesity that builds up becomes the result of all of this excess fructose that's coming in the body here. Um, but that's not the only bad thing that fructose does in. Here, as it's going to the mitochondria, before it gets there, it goes through several different stages. And one of the stages in the middle there, called xylose 5-phosphate, we'll just call it 5-P, actually is a substance that goes down to the fat factories, and it actually turns on fat factory production. And this liver cell not only is gonna have a one factor, but it's gonna make more fat factories and it actually turns up the production because the liver cell realizes with all of this fructose coming in here, I've got all this xylose 5-phosphate, we're gonna be going to there. 
we've got to build more fat factories. And so we start building more fat factories, which even further accelerates this production of all of the fatty liver and the diabetes and the central obesity there. But that's not all. There's another substance, an enzyme that's getting turned on. It's called JNC1, or some people just refer to it as junk one. But this particular substance here actually goes over, remember the little sugar door I drew the first time? Of course, this is where the sugar door is here, letting the glucose in. Well, at this point right here, it actually starts shutting down that sugar door so it doesn't work. And when we start thinking about that, well, yeah, it's like I've got all this fructose I've got to deal with down here. Please don't send any more glucose in here. So we actually block the normal good functioning of glucose with all of this extra overload of fructose coming in here. And, uh, but that's not all. Another thing that happens here is that the fructose, some of it starts increasing the production of uric acid in the liver. And uh, what does uric acid do? Well, we think of it in terms of gout. You all know what gout is? Gout is a buildup of uric acid in joints causing this severely painful gouty arthritis again driven by all of this fructose coming in here. But there's something else very interesting that it does. And to understand it here, we take a look at the, uh, an artery wall. We've done this a little bit here, but. An artery wall has the lining of these little endothelial cells and then outside the endothelial cells, there is some muscle cells, a layer of muscle cells. We'll put those in here. And then there is an outer layer past there. Well, that layer of muscles there constricts and makes the artery smaller or relaxes and allows more blood flow through there. And the way we cause it to constrict and pull down is with adrenaline, epinephrine, and there's special nerves that bring adrenaline there and release adrenaline whenever you wanna constrict a blood vessel. And your body has a whole control system that squeezes down the arteries it needs when it needs to control the flow of blood wherever it's needed in the body. Well, when we're done needing that, how do we get it to relax? Well, there is a substance called nitric oxide. And there's an enzyme that's located right in these endothelial cells called nitric oxide synthetase, NOS. We'll just put it there, NOS there in this things. And Well, we'll just write it here, N-O-S. But it's actually inside these cells. And it makes nitric oxide. Now that's not the word no. That's uh, nitrogen oxygen. It's a chemical compound called nitric oxide. And this nitric oxide, which is made in the endothelial, soaks out into the muscle and causes it to relax the muscle so that it can relax, dilate, and allow more blood flow. So what does uric acid do? Well, this uric acid, when it goes out there, actually blocks the nitric oxide synthetase. And in the process of blocking that, it prevents the normal relaxation. So we've got all these arteries, they're being constricted down, but they're not allowed to relax. What is that gonna to do to the blood pressure? Well, if you keep squeezing it down, the pressure's gonna go up, right? And here we have a significant 
contributor to hypertension, high blood pressure. So now we've connected all this excess fructose through uric acid, the blocking of the nitric oxide synthetase and the production of nitric oxide leading to hypertension. But there's more bad things that can happen. Remember when we talked about the arteries and the process of arteriosclerosis here? Um, there we got an artery cross section here. And remember, it would start building up this layer of battlefield debris we would call arterial sclerosis, hardening of the arteries that eventually uh, can lead to heart attacks and strokes if it gets clotted off in the middle there. platelets plug on it and the clot forms in there and when it blocks it if that's an artery inside of our heart we just created a heart attack if that was an artery in the brain we just created a stroke so let's put that into our picture here we'll just put here Myocardial infarctions and strokes. Okay. Now, we talked about the other night how oxidized fat and oxidized cholesterol leads to that buildup there. But did you know there's another substance that causes the immune system to attack and destroy and builds this process? It's something called AGE advanced glycation in products. Now let's just put that here. It's not age, although it does age you, but it's, what does it say here? Advanced glycation in products. And what that is, is sugar can get stuck on proteins. And when sugar sticks on a protein, the protein doesn't work anymore. It can't function properly. And so the body realizes that these glycated proteins are not good, they don't. And so it actually tries to destroy them. And as the macrophages try to destroy those coming through the blood here, they again build up this battlefield debris here inside the artery wall. And that there. And what we realize today that these AGEs, advanced glycation, these glycated proteins are a very serious cause of atherosclerosis, maybe as much or even more so than the oxidized fat and cholesterol that we've talked about. And of course, it's caused by sugar. And of course, if you've got higher sugar levels, there's going to be more of this going on. But the interesting thing is glucose and fructose are different in their ability to glycate proteins. And fructose is seven times more, I'll just put fructose here. So we've got fructose here, seven times more powerful than glucose at creating these AGEs, which are driving this atherosclerotic process here that's causing heart attacks and strokes. So as we look at that picture right there, I hope you can appreciate all of the bad stuff that fructose is doing to you. And it's coming from sugar. The sugar that's in the uh, diet, 
in the form of sodas, other sugar drinks, candies, cakes, pie. They just put it in almost the ingredients of almost most packaged prepared foods. You'll see the word sugar in there. But again, the sodas and the other sugar drinks are probably the major source in our diet in this country that is driving this process right here. Now, if we think about that for a moment here and look at it, we realize that uh, we are really pushing a process along here that's, just think about what are all the diseases that are affecting our country and affecting everything here. We've got diabetes, obesity, we've got heart attacks, we've got strokes, we've got high blood pressure, hypertension, and we've got fatty liver disease leading to cirrhosis there. This is driving all of those disease processes there. And it's really, really something. You can see why if you really want to turn your health around, we're gonna to have to take a step away from all of these sources of refined sugar in the diet and come back to the simple plant-based fruit and vegetable diet. Now, if you're just eating fruit, the amount of fructose in the fruit, as we talked about earlier, is very small and it's mixed with fiber so that it's very slowly absorbed. So the amount of fructose in the bloodstream, even if you're eating lots of fruit and apples and mangoes and bananas and all these different things, the amount of fructose in there is actually very, very small. And that very small amount can easily be burned in the mitochondria as fuel and it doesn't have to go down through all of these other processes. And so eating fruit does not drive these processes in the way that taking in refined sugar. You know, back in the 1800s, they had slave labor. We've moved from that to fossil fuels, and now we have huge machines. It's very easy to make uh, sugar. And of course, now with the high fructose corn syrup, by the way, do you know who invented high fructose corn syrup? The Japanese. Yeah, the Japanese. Somebody said that's their revenge for the atomic bomb. Uh, you know, we got so, the atomic bomb did this much, but uh, high fructose uh, corn syrup has done a lot more damage than an atomic bomb over here, if you think about what it's doing through the side in here. And of course, high fructose corn syrup is really cheap compared to regular sucrose sugar from sugar cane. So we've got even another reason for them to be putting more in there. Another reason to increase the fructose content of food, fructose is sweeter than glucose. If you put it on a scale, fructose is much sweeter than glucose. And so if you want to make something really sweet, what do you do? You put more fructose in it. Uh, in you know, by adding high fructose corn syrup, it's sweeter than sugar. You know, if you take the equal amounts of both, same there, you'll get a sweeter taste with the high fructose corn syrup. And now some of the drinks are actually taking and just adding pure fructose to them to make them sweeter. There are some I've seen out where they're putting in just only fructose into the drink. And, uh, you know, it's a really sweet drink, but uh, again, we're moving to pure poison as we start moving to the uh, pure uh, fructose there. Some people want to ask, well, what about some of the other, th well, what about honey? Isn't honey natural, isn't that good for you? Well, if you take honey, now it does, it's basically pure sugar. It does have some various flavorings and taste and some things that have put in there, but by and large, it's pure sugar and within a few nanoseconds of getting into your digestive tract, it turns into a 50-50 mixture of glucose and fructose. So in terms of everything we're talking about here, whether you're putting in sugar or honey or whatever, we're really doing the same thing in terms of the amount of fructose. If you put in a lot of honey, you're putting in a lot of fructose. And some of the other ones, agave, um, the uh, maple syrup, there's a number of other refined, they're basically all refined sugars of some form. We've removed all of the fiber and bulk and we're coming in with just pure sugar. And the pure sugar is gonna be a 50-50 mix of glucose and fructose.
and so we're moving down that uh, fructose poisoning route. Um, what are the safe ways to sweeten food? What do we put in it? Well, remember I sentenced the first night and we talked about diabetes? What was the very first sentence we taught you? Whole plant foods eaten whole. So you could take some really sweet fruit, that would sweeten it. You can take a dried fruit. Let's take a raisin. Uh, you've taken a grape and now you've dried it out, you've taken the water out, how much of the fiber is still there? All of it. The vitamins and minerals, they're all still there. The sugars, they're all still there. And so raisins, although they're quite sweet, actually have all of that fiber and stuff mixed with them there. One of the things a lot of us like to do in our, when you want something sweet is we add dates to it. Uh, dates, again, you've got this very sweet fruit, but it is full of fiber, vitamins, minerals, and other things there. Very healthy and good for you. And actually, if you go to the glycemic index scale that a lot of people like to measure, even though you think of, of dates as a very sweet food, they're actually low glycemic. They're less than 50 on that glycemic scale. You know, sugar is at 100 and many of these other things are up there. But uh, dates are actually a low glycemic food. And yet they're very sweet to taste, enjoyable if you want something sweet in your diet. Uh, if you haven't tried them, my favorite is the Barhi dates. And you can only get them right now in November. In November is when they harvest the Barhi dates and you can order them. Some stores will carry them or you can order them from the producers down in the desert there and uh, get, you know, a box of them. They keep really good in the refrigerator or freezer. They'll last all year long. Usually they run out by the end of December or January or certainly end of February and then you can't get more from the uh, growers. But uh, there's a lot of other varieties of dates. But this particular one is really soft, sweet, caramely, just completely delicious. And I'd highly recommend trying it there. It's called a Barhi date. Um, what color is it? What color are the dates? Dates are brown. They all look the same color. Yeah, I don't know. We'll have to talk about ask that later. I don't. I don't know quite sure what you're referring to there. Um, okay, so so we start looking at the uh, tremendous damage how we've driven this process here with this one particular substance right here. You know, they say a picture's worth a thousand words. Well, this picture here worth a million bucks. I mean, if you start looking at what is happening with our health care in this country right now, the tremendous expense that is going in, what diseases is it going for? Diabetes, obesity, heart attacks, and of course the sequelae of the heart attacks is the congestive heart failure, and so they've got that there. By the way, in the hospital, between diabetes and CHF, the result of this, is huge, the amount of hospital days, hospital stays, the amount of expense that goes in to managing the complications of diabetes and the complications of heart disease here. Strokes, very devastating there in terms of their disabilities, high blood pressure, tremendous amount of work is going into fighting blood pressure with all different kinds of drugs. We need to go back and treat the causes of it. And one of the causes is right here. So. Just right here, we could solve the entire healthcare budget, budget problem right there. Isn't that amazing? Just with that one picture right there, you've got everything you need. If we could get uh, our government to uh, take a look at that and actually start implementing that. And some people are beginning to realize that now. You know, it used to be smoking was a big thing and everybody smoked and then they started saying it was bad and pretty soon now everybody understands that smoking is bad. And now they're starting to realize some of this stuff about sugar right here. You know, in the last election here in California, several uh, 
local areas were actually taking laws to try to reduce sugar consumption by taxing it or making it more difficult to get in some way. I mentioned the school that where they experimented with taking it out. And some places are beginning to realize that the sugar drinks are really, really a major cause of disease that needs to be dealt with here. But as we come down to it, you know, in our own lives, as we look for health and getting rid of disease, you know, we talked about, you know, you can treat diseases by treating the symptoms. You know, with diabetes, there's all kinds of pills and insulin we can take. But the real answer is to come back to the cause. Whole plant foods eaten whole. Walk, 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 walk. And uh, it turns around. Same is true with hypertension. Whole plant foods eaten whole. Walk, 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 walk. And hypertension turns around. And uh, heart disease, this atherosclerosis that builds up in the artery walls. We talked about that in our last lecture. Again, you can actually reverse that arterial sclerosis, get rid of those plaques, open those arteries up. You don't have to keep going down the road of more heart attacks or strokes. Obesity, of course, the weight can come off. All of these things can be taken care of with just this simple changes here when you come back and what we're really doing is what God designed in the beginning. You know, when God created the human race, you know, you can read about it in the book of Genesis. What did he say? I've given you every tree bearing fruit and all these plants that have seeds. This is to be your food. Well, if you just went around and followed that first instruction that God gave to the human race, and we started eating the fruits of the trees and the plants and the seeds and all those things, what would we be eating? Whole plant foods eaten whole. You know, we could go through the garden doing that and we can still do that today. And we could eliminate so many of these disease processes that are coming on by just coming back to that simple dietary plan. You know, God created the human body in all of its complexity. He knows exactly what it needs. And he put exactly all of those vitamins and minerals, antioxidants, bioflavonoids, all these different things in these plants for us to eat. And we've talked about just one of the problems here with refined foods, but there we could look at the other problems with some of the animal foods. One of the fascinating things is to look at the effects of all the things we don't know. You know, somebody analyzed a blueberry once, and they found out there was over 600 bioactive substances in a blueberry. Now, normally we think of what? We think of, you know, different vitamins, you know, dozens, maybe 20 or so different vitamins, and then there's other substances we know that do something. But there's over 600 things in a blueberry that all go into cells, they're digested, they're taken up, cells take them in. We don't even know what they're all doing. But God did, he designed them and he put them in the blueberry. And then somebody analyzed the garlic and garlic has over 900 different bioactive chemicals of various kinds. And people are beginning to discover some of the healing, health-giving properties in garlic. Of course, what do they do? Well, let's extract it and make garlic pills, and let's uh, make blueberry pills, and you can get that. And another one that's been is the effects of palm granites. Wow, there's some really good stuff in palm granites, and, they, and so people are making palm granite pills, but God made palm granites. <laughs> and you know, the nearer we come to eating it the way that God made it, we're getting all of these different things, not just the single substance that he, you know, that we find something good and we try to put it in a pill and sell it and make money from it. But uh, instead of buying this vitamin or that vitamin, you know, you realize you're not getting all of the other hundreds that were put in there. And you could analyze a strawberry or a zucchini or a tomato, and they're just full and full of all of these different types of substances that uh, the body needs and can use. And ideal health is when you come down to real nutrition. Real nutrition is when you're putting in the body everything it needs, not just 
one nutrient here, you know, how many grams of protein should I get, how many grams of carbohydrates. A lot of dietary guidance comes down to calculating and measuring all of these things. If you just eat the whole plant foods, you'll get the right amount of protein, the right amount of carbohydrates, the right amount, and you'll get all of these other vitamins. God also made the year to go in seasons. And as we move through the year, there's a time when the apricots and cherries are coming out and a time later when the peaches are coming out and tomatoes and corn and zucchini. And you go on with all of the fruits. By the time you get the fall, you're getting apples and pears. And in the winter, we've got the citrus fruits. And you just keep going through this yearly cycle of all of these foods. Over the year, you get a tremendous amount of variety, which does great for taste, but also you're getting all of these different vitamins, because each one has difference of this and, and whatever might have been lacking here, well now it'll be here. And now this one brings in this that you need here, and this one brings in this. And we keep bringing all of these different substances in that the body can uh, use to create exactly what every cell in your body needs without all of these toxic poisonous effects we've talked about here, when you start taking one chemical and putting it in huge excess with all of this sugar pouring in, all of this fructose poisoning coming in, we are really poisoning our body with this one chemical. Any chemical in excess is too much. You know, people talking about taking too much salt or too much this or too much that. You know, there's a right amount and there's a wrong amount. And of course, the, what we are doing with the various manufacturing processes in the country today is making huge, huge excess amounts of this food that was never ever designed or meant to be in the human body. And so I hope that as you've been impressed by what we've shared here tonight that you can really come around and say it's time to clean out our cupboards and shelves, walk past the soda machine, walk past all of these sugar drinks, get past all of these desserts and everything that has all these in and start replacing those things in our diets with the various whole plant foods that God created there for us make a huge amount of difference in health. We could probably make more difference with this one dietary change than any of the others we've talked about. And so hopefully this has impressed that on you and uh, you can inspire to go home and really make that a big change, not just something, yeah, that was great to hear, but yeah, I'm going to do that. I'm going to live this new life, and it's really going to turn things around for me. Uh, you'll probably notice a really big change right off. Mm -hmm.